think about Moses and Aaron and who they were. And they talked to Pharaoh. Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, let my people go, that they may hold a feast unto me in the wilderness. And Pharaoh said, Who is the Lord? And that's the that's where we're going to be studying today. Who is the Lord that I shall obey his voice to let Israel go? I don't know your God. Neither will I obey him. We have a fabulous, fabulous lesson on this. And Aaron and Moses said, verse 3, the God of the Hebrews has met with us. Now we don't know if he sat under the oak tree like he did with Gideon last week, or if he sat on the wall like he did with Abraham. But they met with the God of the Hebrews, probably at the burning bush. And since Aaron is here, and, he, and, the, and the word says, the God of the, the Hebrews met us. We don't know exactly where that was. Let us go, pray thee, three days journey into the desert, and sacrifice unto the Lord our God, lest he fall upon us with pestilence or with the sword. And this glamorous king of Egypt said, Wherefore did you, Moses and Aaron, let the people get away from the works? Get you unto your gardens. And Pharaoh said, Behold, the people of the land now are many. And we make them rest for their you make them rest for their burdens. They were a source of income. And the bad news that Moses had was to go down and say, Pharaoh, you're going to lose. Your income. And Pharaoh commanded the same day the taskmasters of the people and their officers say, verse 7, ye shall no more give the people straw to make brick. As heretofore. Let them go and gather straw for themselves. And the tally of the bricks which they did make heretofore, ye shall lay upon them, ye shall not diminish aught thereof. For these people are idle. Therefore they cry, say, let us go sacrifice unto their God. Let their little work be laid upon the, the men, that they may labor therein, and let them not regard vain words. Look at the last verse. Let the work be laid upon the men. <coughs> and look at verse 8. When he says, Therefore they cry. These folks are going, he's making fun of them. Let's He's making fun of them. Therefore they cry. Now I want you to look at verse 1, and it says, Moses and Aaron. And when, with the last night I was thinking about this thing and I've studied this all week long. I've made hours and hours and hours of studies with these things. And, but even last night, I go to bed about three hours and I get up for the rest of the night. Because this is important to me. And as often as I've taught this book, I still study it like it's the first time. And I was thinking last night, now that that took care of the thing last night, I'll wait till Saturday night to get ready. God help us if anybody does. Amen? Amen. <clears throat> One thing I find about bivocational pastors, this is free. One thing I find about bivocational pastors, if you do a music business, you do that first and you do the ministry last. If you're a real estate guy that is in the ministry, you do your real estate first, then you do your ministry last. If you do anything else, you usually do it first because by vocational folks, they have to do what makes the money first. And the ministry suffers. Can you say that? It's true. It's true. Okay, now, get back to the word. After Moses and Aaron, brother, sister, I can see Moses and Aaron having come from the desert. Moses has just gone to the burning bush. 
He's cried out to God, God, I can't talk. My speech is contemptible. I'm slow. Send Aaron to go with me. And here comes Aaron. He sees his brother. And the brothers go together. They go down to this glamorous place called Egypt. And these two unsightly men, maybe with a little hay in their hair, they don't look bright. They have Hebrew clothes on. They have Bedouin, Bedouin, which means shepherd. They have their type of clothes on. And here come these two unsightly people into the courts of Pharaoh. And they look at Pharaoh and they say, Pharaoh, God has done with us. And a lot of times, Brother Johnny, we wonder why we see the people we see in church. Sometimes you think, I'm the only one that's got crazy people in my church. You're not the only one. And you say, Amen. They seem like all the crazy go to church. Get up, God. Pharaoh stands there and looks at him. He's sitting on his throne. He has all the maids and all the men servants around him. He has the ostriches walking up and down, the peacocks walking up and down. When they used to make parties in their church, they'd have a mile long party like in Daniel's day. When he had a great, when he had a thousand of his princes and two thousand of his other people, they had peacocks trained to pull the, 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 the trays of grapes and pomegranates up and down the tables of marble. And here comes these two unsightly people. And they had bad news for him. They said, we're going to ask you to let all your people go. Give up three and a half million slaves. And let us go to worship. And you know, Brother Johnny, I read that let us go to worship three days journey. They were planning on coming back. If you go somewhere for three days, you're not coming back to your burdens. It's right. Amen. And Pharaoh says, who is this Lord? And who is he that I should obey him? And I'm giving you here the names of God found in sacred, say sacred scripture. And I'm giving you, turn over here to your last page where it says the names of Jesus in the Revelation. The name of Jesus in the Revelation. <laughs> Give me your paper, baby. Oh, here's one here. There we go. Look at this first form from the dead. Revelation 1 5. This is the Son of God. He's the first form from the dead. He's the highest of earthly kings. And here's the scriptures on the left and what he is on the right. He is Alpha and Omega, the Lord God, the Lord Almighty, the Son of Man, the first and the last, the living one, the Son of God, witness, also faithful witness. He is a creator, the lion of the tribe of Judah. He's the root of the Lamb, the Shepherd, the Christ, the Mighty. He's the faithful and true, the Word of God, the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords. That's who this Christ is. Amen. Pharaoh said, who is this man that I should worship him? Everybody turn to Revelation chapter 19, verse 16. Revelation 19, 16. Jesus Christ has a tattoo. How many knew this? Jesus Christ has a tattoo for all you tattoo wearers. Revelation 19, 16. Everybody there? And it says, And on his vesture and on his thigh. That's on his vesture is his clothing, Brother Johnny. On his vesture and on his clothing and on his skin, his thigh. He has a name written. King of kings and Lord of lords. Brother, that means if something is happening to Jesus and it won't. But if something should happen to Jesus where he closes his clothing, it's still on his side. King of kings and Lord of lords. And Pharaoh, that's who Jesus is. Right. Amen. He's the yellow king. Turn over here. Names of God. He's the yellow king. He's the El Leon. He's the El Roy. He's the El 
Shaddai. He's in Jehovah, the Yahweh. That's who God is. Now I want you to do a very, very famous thing. I hope you underline that thing in, in Revelation 19.16. And now we'll turn over to Isaiah chapter 63. We're going to sit here for a few, for a few minutes. I want to show you who Pharaoh was talking about. These two men come to him and he looks down on them in his garments. And all these people around him, these great peacocks and all this stuff going on. And Pharaoh stands up, the king of the world. He stands up and looks at these two little ungodly guys and says to them, Who is this God? Who is this God? Isaiah 63 will tell you this is a marvelous thing. And let me tell you something, folks. This is the only place in Scripture where this is found. The only place in Scripture where Jesus comes. Isaiah chapter 63. The only place in Scripture where this is found. Are you, are you there? Wait me if you're there. Okay. Is this and see this also asks a question. Pharaoh said, Who is this God that I should worship? And I'm not gonna obey him either. Oh, really? Uh-huh. I've met people like this because they're healthy and alive, they think that God is somewhere in the distance, somewhere, and they have all kinds of attitudes towards God. The Bible tells you and me as saints of God to fear the Lord. Can you say amen? Fear means respect, and we respect. He's not going to hurt us, but we stand before Him and we throw our crowns before Him and we give Him glory and honor because He's God Almighty. God Almighty. Amen. Isaiah 63, look at this first question. Who is this that comes from Edom with garments dyed bread from Basra? Oh, that will that that rock your socks, but just go on. This that is glorious in his apparel. Does this person look like he's down and out? No. He's glorious in his apparel. Oh, this is it. I, I, I already feel excited just to do because I'm going to talk about it. He is traveling in the greatness of his strength. Who is this guy? I that speak in righteousness. I that am mighty to save. That's who I am. And then the question comes to the saints, the prophets. Wherefore art thou led in your apparel? And thy garments like him that treads the wine fast. Oh. Verse 3. The reason I am ready because I have trodden the wine press alone. And of the people there is none with me. For I will tread them in my anger. And trample them in my fury, and their blood shall be sprinkled upon my garments, Pharaoh. I will walk in the press, in the, in the press of the wine press, and there I'm going to take their, 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 their blood and just trump it over my head and wring out the garments. Turn all my garments red. Look at verse 4. For the day of vengeance is in my heart. And the year of my redeemed is come. Verse 5 gives us surprises. I looked. There was none to help me. And I wondered why there was none to help me. So I went ahead. And my own right arm brought, therefore brought me salvation unto me. And my fury. It upheld me. Pharaoh. The God that you say that you will not obey. The God that you say, who is this Lord? In Isaiah 63, it says, this is the one that comes from Edom and Basra. And he has walked the wine press of God alone. This is the time and the only time in Scripture when Jesus gets his. Before the end of the world. Wow. No more failing friendships. In Isaiah 62, there's no more rejection of people. He was despised and rejected of men. No more. No more suffering Savior. Pharaoh, you're talking about God who will not be put down. You're talking about God who will stand and say, this is what I am. And in Isaiah 63, he's walking 
in the greatness of his glory. He's walking not as a guy with his ball being up, but he comes in glory and pompous. He said, I have won the victory. I have taken the fight. I have taken my salvation. <coughs> the only place in scripture. What is this fact? Jesus gets his before the end of the world. I remember in the Garden of Gethsemane, John is the only one who talks about it because John is the autoptic gospel. Matthew, Mark, and Luke are synoptic gospels. John is autoptic. John talks about what Jesus thought about. And in the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus opens his robe and his, he says, they said, we're here to seek Jesus of Nazareth. He went like this. And all the people fell around. And the verse said, the Bible has only one little verse like that. And a lot of times, brother, we miss it. We're reading so quick, we just miss it. But Jesus reveals himself like he did on the Mount of Transfiguration. And you know why they asked him, Lord, why are your garments red? Why are you red from head to toe? Because usually, sister, wait, wait, what is He's very quiet. When Jesus comes back in Revelation 16, when Revelation 9, 16, 16 whatever it was, 9, 16, he comes back and he's on a white horse and he's wearing white. When he's up there on the Mount of Transfiguration, he's dressed in white. Every time I see Jesus, he's dressed in white. But not here. Not here, Pharaoh. No, 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 no. He is getting his revenge. He's getting his fury. He looks around at the church. He sees nobody there. John is not there. Wiggins is not there. Oh, is not there. No. You go ahead and make fun. You go ahead and cry. Say, oh, they cry, they cry. They want to go worship. They want to go worship like a child. Do you think God was impressed with that? God is not impressed. And we have brothers and sisters, I'm telling you what, we have men that, 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 that believe that Jesus is with a twist. They have, they have their girlfriends, and then now they call them fiancés. They live with them. When you live with somebody, When you are homosexual, you're in sin. Oh, there's stop. It's not politically correct. Do we care that we're politically correct? You know why we're politically incorrect? Because the church has stopped doing their job. And because the church has stopped doing their job, the state takes over. And they say, well, we can't say words like this. But brother, sister, we used to have welfare. We used to take care of our mothers and daddies. We used to take care of people. They were poor. I want to say 10,000 things. I want to say them all first. Oh, brother, what the Bible belt? What is the Bible belt? In Isaiah 63, you know what? It's not the Bible belt anymore. I have trouble, look at verse 3. I have trouble the wine press alone in Pharaoh. And of the people, there was none with me. Pharaoh, you weren't there. Moses, you weren't there. By the way, look across the world to verse 11 in Isaiah 63. We're back to Exodus. Look at verse 11. Then he remembered the days of old. Moses and his people. Saying, where is he that brought us out of the Red Sea? With the shepherds of his flock. Where is he that put the Holy Spirit in there? That's a, I have that marked in blue. That's the Holy Spirit. In the book of Exodus. Then he remembered. But in verse 10. They rebelled and vexed his Holy Spirit. That's not blasphemy, that's grieving. The Word of God says two things. Thou shalt not quench the Holy Spirit. Thou shalt not grieve the Holy Spirit. Now, Pharaoh, we're going to talk about the third person of the Trinity now. Not even Jesus in the Revelation or God. But let's talk about the Holy Spirit for a few moments. The Word of God says do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God. Whereby you are sealed of the day of redemption. We were talking about that. My brother and I was talking about this. The, 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 when people come and get 
say. Do you think that people know when they're saved? Can you say amen? Do people know when they're sealed by the Holy Ghost? Do you know when you feel like the saran wrap is all around you and God says, now you're mine? Do you think there's a feeling where you know this? Yes! And the Word of God says, grieve not the Holy Spirit of God. Don't grieve the Spirit. And how do I grieve the Spirit? With anger, cussing, stupid gesture. Do you know the word of God says don't even that foolish church to be named among you one time has become a saints. You know what folks? We're a long way off for we ought to be. Can you say amen? We're a long way off. God, if his church, Brother Johnny, if his church ever got together and decided to be what they want with God, God wants it to be. If we ever say to God, I'm going to be 36 inches to the yard, I'm going to be 16 the ounces to the pound. Trying to heal somebody and, and 
you're not. Like they, one man we saw one time, he opened up all the doors in the church and he. That, that was that, that, that was done. Thing? That was done at the church over across the street. No, no, nothing that you do in a service trying to pretend. A lot of preachers don't study. Therefore, they do all kinds of stuff in the service. And you can tell if somebody hasn't studied. They have all kinds of extra stuff going on. They pretend like it's real. They pretend like it's necessary. It's not. When you study, all you have to do is give the word. And everybody's healed. Everybody's blessed. Everybody goes home satisfied. Everybody goes home filled with spirits. What I'm saying is this. When Jesus was healing those people and they said, that is the by the, he cast out devils by the power of Satan. He called him Beelzebub. Jesus stopped and said, curse my father has forgiven you. Not a good idea, but he said, curse me, it's forgiven you. This is God, Jesus words himself. If you blaspheme the Holy Spirit, and the only thing that blasphemy the Holy Spirit is, is somebody that knows better. A sinner cannot hardly blaspheme the Holy Spirit. Because they're sinners, they don't know, they're, they're out there, they are with all their sin, they say things about the Holy Spirit, but they don't know. Paul the Apostle killed Christians. He became saved. You know what he said later? He said, I received mercy because I was ignorant. So what I'm talking about usually is somebody in the church that has backslidden and they know better and they're telling each other or themselves or somebody else that the power that the Holy Spirit is doing is again, it is by Satan. Is that it? Yes. Yeah, don't worry. See, that's why I brought this up. Because Satan would go home and say, Oh, you blasphemed the Holy Spirit. And in our ignorance, we say, Oh, I guess I, no. Don't. Paul said, I will not have you be ignorant, brother. So you're saying that if um, the Spirit's moving in the church and there's a person that has the Holy Ghost and they say, Well, maybe that wasn't the Spirit, maybe it was something else, that's blasphemy. No. No. No, you can doubt. If you see things going on in the church, and like I said, there's a lot of stuff that goes on in Pentecost. A lot of the, the Baptists and Methodists don't have the, 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 the their, their, their service is so regimented, they don't have any freedom in the spirit. So a lot of times we take our freedom as a license to do other things. And we see, I, I see people put, put Satan's name on the floor and they step on it like this and they say, uh, put Satan under your feet. Let me tell you something. Satan is not afraid of you your testimony. Can you say amen? Say amen. He's not. He is second only to God. Satan is afraid of the word and he's afraid of the blood of Jesus. Don't, don't get coy with Satan. Don't get coy with Satan. Oh, I'm going to put him under my feet like this. And, uh, he's not afraid of your feet. He's not afraid of your two by four testimony. This is good teaching, brother. Good teaching, sister. Go ahead. Is it, is it a heart thing? I mean, is it... Uh, uh, it's rebellion in the heart. Right. It's when you know better. And, you, and you're angry inside. You're angry at yeah. God. And you go, see, I, I, see, I knew somebody was going to be needing this. You, you're very concerned about this. Yeah, but let me tell you something. If you're sitting in church, that proves you have a good glass of the Spirit. Okay? <laughs> Let me tell you something about God. God, how many can say God is not fickle? Everybody say that. God is not fickle. God doesn't allow you, if you bless the Holy Spirit, He doesn't play you along for 80 years, 70 years, 50 years, and you come to church and you cry, and, you, and by the time you get ready to go to heaven, God says, oh, no, no, back in 1932, you blasted the Holy Spirit. You ain't coming. No, no, no. Satan does that kind of stuff, not God. So if you rise through the Holy Spirit, you don't want to be in church, you won't be in church, you don't want to be in church. Okay? If you have any desire for God, it shows you have not blasphemed the Spirit. The Word of God says they were saying, Jesus, you were healing the people by the power of the enemy. And Jesus said, can't say that. 
Heading back to our text, Pharaoh said, Who is this Lord? Have you got a better understanding about who God is? I'm going to tell you what, brother, sister, God. And let, let's do this. Turn over to 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and you pull her back. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. First Corinthians chapter 15. This is the end. Oh. Let me tell you something, folks. Jesus knows his place in the kingdom of God. Can you say amen? amen. He is second to the Father. They're so close together, they're like, they're like water. Water is steam, water, or ice. They're all water. Can you say amen? We watch him on the Easter Channel about them driving along these lakes with 17,000 pounds. Six inches of ice can hold the heaviest weight. But ice, water, and steam is the same thing. An egg is a yolk, the white stuff, and the shell. All three it takes to be an egg. If you haven't got a yolk, it's not an egg. If you haven't got a shell, it's not an egg. If you haven't got the white stuff, it's not an egg. The same in the Spirit of God. God and the God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. They are three in one. But even in that, God knows His place. Jesus knows His place. And the Holy Spirit knows His place. The Holy Spirit, and let me say it this way. God redeems. Or God creates. Jesus redeems. The Holy Spirit sanctifies. Everybody say that with me. God creates. God creates. Jesus redeems. Jesus redeems. And the Holy Spirit sanctifies. The Holy Spirit sanctifies. They're three in one, but they have different jobs. They have different ministries. Now look at 1 Corinthians chapter 15. My time is over. Then come at the end, chapter 15, verse 24. And back, verse 23 says, Every man in his own order. Godhead and man. Christ is the first fruits. Afterwards, this is the chain of command, they that are Christ that is coming. Now watch this. Then comes the end. When he shall have delivered up the kingdom to God, even the Father. This is showing the separation between Jesus and the Father. Then comes the end. When he, Christ, has delivered up the kingdom to his Father. When he shall have put down all rule and all authority and power. Look verse 25. For he must reign until. Christ reigns until. He has put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy that should be destroyed is what, class? Death. Death. Now watch verse 27. Who is this God, Pharaoh? This is at the end of the world. When this Jesus says to the Father, All things are done, and I will now go and be under your authority. I will be under your command. For you are God, and God is God, and Jesus is the Son, and the Holy Spirit is the Spirit. Look at verse 27. For he hath put all things under his feet. But when he saith all things are under his feet, it is manifest that he himself is accepted. Which did put all, all things under him. Now uh, that was unnecessary in my book, but to make sure you understand what he's saying, he's saying now Jesus doesn't put himself under his feet. He puts everything else under his feet. And look at verse 28. And when you read it with me, and when all things shall be subdued unto him, read this. Then shall the Son also himself be subject unto him that put all, all things under him that love him. That God may be all in all. My dear my brother, even in the world, even in the world of the Spirit, there are chains of commands. Even in the word of the world of the Spirit, God is God, Jesus is the Son, the Holy Spirit. Colossians says he has made one new man. Colossians says he has given us a spirit, and under him is a spirit. God is God, the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of Jesus. 
There's all kinds of ways to save it. There's like the egg. There's always a shell. There's always the whites. There's always the yolk. Can everybody see this now? Clearly. Amen. Pharaoh says, who is this Lord? And then he runs around like a little child. And he said, oh, do you want to go to worship? Do you want to go to worship? He had no idea that he did He had no idea of the power of his Christ in Isaiah chapter 63. You see, there comes a time, folks, when we Christians have put up with and put up with and put up with all the things. But there comes a time when Pharaoh and people say to us, and who is this to God? And they stand up like they're so strong. Who is it? See, Pharaoh was feeling very healthy. Pharaoh was surrounded by all his kingdom. And all the glory to it. He was a king of the world. And these two itinerant preachers were walking in. And they would have a staff. God help me. He had a staff. Nobody knew that. They said, we're going to set the plagues next week. And I've been studying them and I've studied them. I'm trying to see the revelation. Trying to see who the revelation of the plagues is. And Moses and Elijah. I go far, far, far beyond this black study. So I will know. So if you ask a question, I'll know the answer. But none of us know everything. Can you say amen? amen. Ask my wife, she'll tell you. He's perfect. Pharaoh was feeling very real, real strong. And Pharaoh said, Who is this Lord that I should worship? And then, then he said, My brother, he said, Not only will I do I not know him, but I will not obey his voice. And then the next chapter we're going to go into, it has the plagues, flies, lice, frogs, locusts, darkness, and then the death of the first, firstborn. Oh, and a little itinerant preacher, that little old rod, every time, every time God got a break for him to do it, he said, spread the rod, do this with the rod. And Pharaoh marvelously does these things. Our class is over. First Corinthians 15, verse 28. And when all things are subdued unto Christ, then shall the Son also himself be subject unto him that put all things under his feet, that God may be all in all. Amen. God said again, God redeems. God redeems. I mean, I'm sorry. God creates. God creates. Jesus redeems. Jesus redeems. The Holy Spirit sanctifies. The Holy Spirit sanctifies. And I'm not going to get into it, but you know what else? The Church of God has stopped preaching about a lot. That sanctification process. The sanctification process of becoming we're saved. And I tell you what, before, whether or not you know it, if somebody walks up to the altar and they get saved and then they get baptized in the Holy Spirit, whether they do it or not, they were sanctified in between. What does sanctify mean? When God burns out your residual sin. And I've told you before in this class, when somebody's coming to this altar, let them pray through. Can you say amen? Let them pray through. Don't walk over to somebody at the altar who's crying and praying and saying, you got it, brother. You, got it. you don't know what they got. And if you're being filled with the Holy Spirit, don't say, you got it. Because they haven't got it yet. It didn't come from Jesus. It came from you. And what did they get from you? Nothing but you. Let them prevail over their sins. Let them prevail like a woman in birth. A woman in birth in Christ. I mean, Mama said with the hair curl over that. And Mama, I, I was a labor 14 years or 14 hours. Mothers know what that prevail is. And then the Word of God says so beautifully, once the baby's born, you forget your pain. Because you see the baby. Oh, brothers and sisters, when we're getting saved, let's get to this altar and let's kneel down and let's pray till God touches us. Till God saves us. And like my brother and I was saying about earlier, when God saves you, you know it. And when God saves you, we know it. Amen. Prince and his friend was walking down the streets. They were walking under some people with some kids sitting up in a Bible college. 
sitting up there in the thing, and this man was very smart, and one, one guy said, hey, you know Brother So-and-so got saved? The older preacher said, we'll see. We'll see. And you know what? I like people to see what God has done in salvation. Amen. And they will see it. Amen. Even the cats and dogs knew when I got saved at 12, I used to throw them over a clothesline with the tails tied together. <laughs> you ever see what happens to cats when you throw up a clothesline with two tails tied together? It's not very good. But even they knew I got saved. And then we get sanctified. And there's a bunch of scriptures that have been, been, been worth sanctification. Sanctified. That's when God comes in and not only does He forgive your past sins. Let me, let, let me give this to you before I, uh, I'm not even ready to close, but let me give this to you. Do you mind? <laughs> Brother Green, one person said, go ahead. <laughs> the rest said, where's the God? When you're born in the cradle, you take all your life and you're, you sin. Okay? When you come to Calvary, everything from that moment back and cast in the sea of God's forgetfulness. Here's the part we don't know. From the day we're saved until the day we're judged, the Word of God says everything, whether good or bad, will be judged in the judgment seat of Christ. Hang on, hang on. I went running up the first time one night and I said, Jesus, forgive me my sins, and if I've done anything, oh, you know, that's good. That's for your comfort. But you'll see it in judgment. Now we will be saying amen. Am I right with you, From the time we're saved back to when we were born, all sins are forgiven us. Once you're saved, you're responsible to live like Jesus. So we backslide. Ooh, that's interesting. I've been there, done that. All of us have been there, done that. Amen. Can you say amen? amen? If you say no, you're lying. And that'll be judging in you. But in the judgment seat of Christ, the Word of God says, whether good or bad. The last book of the Revelation, the last chapter says, He's coming and He's bringing with Him So we need to be sanctified. And what that means, it burns out the residual sin. And then we're filled with the Holy Ghost. Saved, sanctified, filled with the Holy Spirit. We'll take it up next week. It's stand your feet.